What's going on everybody? Aaron here helping musicians get better, faster, and today I am live. I'm hanging out with the community and I am ranking a list of community submitted euphonium pieces. I asked you all to send me your favorites and these are most of what came in here and then I fluffed it up with some of my own. If you don't see your favorite piece or you see a composer and you're wondering why I picked that piece or this piece, um, I was just trying to keep it to one piece per composer, trying my best to not do too many transcriptions. Honestly, I don't think there's many on here at all. And I'm trying my best to limit the types of pieces. So I couldn't do like a thousand concertos. Like there's a, I had a, so many concertos. Let's check out the pieces that you all gave me and uh, let's start making people mad, which by the way, this is my list, it's subjective. If you don't like it, if you're not gelling with it, totally cool. If I dog on your favorite piece, that doesn't mean it's a bad piece. All of these composers wrote pieces that are way better than anything I could ever write. Just as somebody with a doctorate in euphonium, this is what I'm going with. I've also got my, my ITEA list and my euphonium repertoire guide if I need some help with some historical information. But I think a doctorate in euphonium qualifies me. All right, so what's the first piece here that we have? The Clonard. Sonata for unaccompanied euphonium. Now this piece has been used a couple times for some competitions and I'll be honest with you, if it wasn't on competitions, I don't think it would be played all that much. I don't think anybody's going out of their way to necessarily play this piece, though if it's being used on competitions, we're finding it academically significant enough to use it, right? So with that, we're gonna kick off this entire thing with a great old C. <laughs> um, every single time one of my students comes to me with this piece, I'm so bored right away. So it's good. It, you know, C is kind of like, I, th I think that's like a point O, right? That's just kind of like goes home, does the work, does what it needs to do. And that's kind of it. And that's how I feel about the Clonard. Moving on. This was not submitted. I put this one in there because I'm upset with my own community for not picking literally the first Euf concerto for euphonium, or at least the first recognized concerto for euphonium. No one picked this piece, the Horowitz Euphonium Concerto. Um, a couple things about this piece. Uh, really important, obviously, it, it, it gets played all the time. It's hasn't really been put on too many, um, it hasn't been put on too many lists, honestly, but it's still a very important piece. A lot of people play it. Um, there's a couple things about it though. Um, it has been gone on record. I mean, I don't, I haven't talked, I never talked to Joe Horvitz about this himself, um, but it's gone on, it's my understanding that he had no idea that Euphonium had four valves when he wrote it. Um, so he didn't, he didn't really write it with the, you know, the compensating system in mind and for it to be such a big piece of music for us, that's kind of a problem. But that's why it's the bassoon cues that go super, super low. But also with the bassoon stuff, he didn't think it was going to sell. He didn't think that it was going to sell for euphonium. So he made it a bassoon concerto essentially, even though it was premiered by the GUS footwear band and all that sort of a thing. Um, so that said, what do I end up thinking about it? Well, the second movement's gorgeous. Um, and I think it's also extremely good characteristic writing for our instrument. So I'm giving it a B. I'm giving it a solid B, which is like my above average grade. All right. Okay, so we, let's let's knock this piece out of the way. I think this is the only real, pure transcription. Uh, I, I believe uh, I might be wrong in that, but Carnival of Venice. Uh, it has been adopted by the Euphonium as a, a piece that it's played a lot. We're going with the Arbin one. Uh, we had a little bit of back and forth in the Discord as to whether we or not we should use Clark or Arbin. We're rolling with the Arbin because I think it is, in my opinion, the harder of the two. Um, it's a great staple. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of stuff you can do with it. But at the end of the day, it wasn't written for us. But that said, it's always a fun time and I'm giving it a B. That just lost me some points with some very academic people. Um, but I like fun pieces. All right, speaking of fun pieces, believe me if all those endearing young charms, this was actually the most requested piece by the community. This one came up about four or five times. Uh, that's why it's in the thumbnail. Believe me if all those endearing young charms is a piece that is overplayed. 
in the brass band world, and for good reason. It's played quite frequently. Uh, it's one of the pieces that got me into college. Um, I think it's a great theme and variation for the first page. Uh, the variation, and then the quick variation there at the end. The two in the middle, I think it's two. It might just be one. This is how much it like, I don't even know. There's, once you get done with that first variation before you get to the stereotypical, but once you get into that middle stuff, it's just the longest cadenza that ever existed that you have to communicate with a piano player over. It's just a lot of F scales. And, and I think it's just fine when it goes with that. And because of, and of course there are players who play it stupid well, but because of that, believe me, if all those enduring young charms is going into the C list, we're giving it a C. Okay. Blue Lake Fantasies, the, a piece that every single time somebody goes, you need to play something unaccompanied here. Cause it's the only one that they ever think of. Um, hard to judge in this capacity because I would say, I would say that some movements like the multiphonics movement is S tier. I think it's great. And then there's some other ones uh, that I think are less than stellar. Um, but overall, I do think it's a great piece of music. And also I think it's something that I think the reason it gets used so much for the unaccompanied stuff is because uh, you can, that's the best way to put this. It's, it's because it was meant to be music that accompanied a scene being at the camp, being at Blue Lake and every single movement, whatever he's talking about, like Firefly, when you're playing that, it feels like a Firefly um, or it sounds like a Firefly. And I think that's really cool. The across the water sounds really good. The jazz portion, like all of those things are very good at personifying what's going on there. Um, and because of that, this one's hard for me. I think I'm gonna give Blue Lake Fantasies our first A of the list. I think overall, I think as much as it has troubled me in my past, uh, <laughs> as much as I've had a hard time with it uh, when I was when I did it when I was an undergrad, uh, there was uh, I had a video on like my personal YouTube page, like not this one, uh, that was being used for a while um, as like a reference recording for like a publisher. Uh, I don't know why I was like 22 at the time, but yeah, I think it's a phenomenal piece of music. Now, Napoli. Um, Napoli is a theme of variations. I believe it's originally for cornet, but I could be wrong there. Um, but I've never, ever heard anybody other than euphonium players play it. Um, I think Stephen Mead has about 40 videos of him playing it and some way shape or form it's a great uh encore piece it's a good concert ender uh of all the theme, theme and variation type things i think it's one of the more solid ones it's a very easy put into the uh, put into the a b tier for me all right now we're getting a little heftier we're kind of out of the the theme and variation land a little bit more historic introduction and dance i always forget if it was originally written for tube or euphonium but it is one of the first pieces for us. And because of that, it is historically significant. It is a very good here in Florida. It's a great grade five. It's something, it's a piece that I think most people should play. Um, I enjoy it as a um, audition piece. Uh, when I get to listen to, you know, incoming undergrads play it, I think it's a piece that everybody needs to play at some point. Really, really solid. Um, that said, there's not a whole heck of a lot really interesting to it um so with that in mind giving it a solid c uh this one by the way this was the first one that i made sure i added in myself i do think the point the piece is really important don't forget c is not bad i don't dislike c uh it's just it's a very good base piece um but i'm not going to put it on a recital anytime soon unless i like need to all right, this one, I think this is the Kevin Day Concerto. This one was the second most. It is a hot, hot piece right now. Everybody is talking about it. Everybody is wanting to play it. Um, of course, Demandre was the, the player in mind, but uh, Hiram's also got a good recording of it. I think Kale Self has been doing it a lot. Uh, it's the piece that everybody wants to play right now. Um, every single undergrad I talk, I talk to, that's like the piece that they're working on. Um, 
I'll be honest, because I have not played with it myself too much. Uh, I've played the second movement a little bit, and then I've worked on the first movement a little bit, but I have not like learned it for anything. Um, and also, Kevin's a, a friend of the channel. He's been on the podcast. Um, I do think... Here's what I'll say. I think it's a really good piece of music. I think I'm really glad that a new piece of concerto, a new concerto uh, is getting as popular as it's getting. I do think it is uh, worth all that. I do think it's a little hard for the sake of hard in certain places. Um, he is a euphonium player and there are some things in there that are not ergonomic. Granted, you're writing for Demandre, so you can do whatever the heck you want. But every once in a while, I look at something Kevin writes and I go, a wizard should know better. Uh, but with that said, I'm gonna slap this, I think in the B tier for me. Really, really good, enjoy it. It's right there with the Horvitz in my opinion. Um, but I'm curious if it's gonna, if it's gonna stay in the test of time. I think it will, by the way. I, I think we'll be talking about this concerto more than some others. Um, but I, I, for me, I think we're gonna put it in the B tier. Grandfather's Clock. A, and this is gonna be weird because it's so hard to like, how do you how do you take something like Introduction and Dance and put it up against Carnival of Venice and put it up against the Kevin Day concerto? They're so different and like academically significant. I'm literally going based off of me as a player. What do I like to play and what do I like to listen to? Moving on, Grandfather's Clock. Now, Grandfather's Clock is not, it's funny because over in the UK and two Euphonium players, it's this really overdone piece. And then here in the US, it's not really done that much, but multiple, especially uh, recently, Amy just put out a thing in the Euphonium Facebook page uh, asking people what their favorite album was. And every a lot of people didn't put an album, they put their favorite piece. And Grandfather's Clock came out multiple times in those situations. Um, it's a great, it's a really good theme and variation. It does theme and variation really well. Uh, where it's not just like the same tempo, but the rhythms get faster. In this case, it, it can, you can gradually get faster with it. There's a lot you can play with itself. I think it is like the perfect stereotypical theme and variation. And with that in mind, I'm also putting it on my album. Uh, but with that in mind, I think I'm going to give it a solid B. <laughs> So we're learning that I don't particularly love any piece <laughs> is like how it feels right now. Um, but the piece, the next piece might change that. Vladimir Kozma, the only piece he wrote for Euphonium, uh, and he's a film composer, if I'm if if I'm not mistaken, I believe he's a French film composer. Um, only piece he wrote for Euphonium. Something going against it though is it's really expensive. Uh, I think it's like a hundred dollars just to get the piano part. Um, I can't imagine what it would be like. I don't even know if you can play it with orchestra at this point. That said, I'm putting the Cosmic Concerto in the A tier. That piece is just good. <laughs> and it's, it's one of my favorite pieces to play and it's just solid. I absolutely love it. Next up, a, another one that was, uh, put up a lot, uh, the Linkola Euphonium Concerto. Um, of all of the pieces here that we are working with today, the Linkola is the one I know the least. I've heard it played. Um, I've never, I actually don't even think this, I think this is the only piece on this list that I don't own. Um, I've heard it played a, a little bit. I've touched it a little, but haven't done too much with it. That said, uh, it's still a great piece of music, but I think it's eluded me because I don't necessarily find it all that great. Um, it's a little more, what's the best way to put it? Weird than my particular taste. And I'm gonna make some people really mad with this, but I think I haven't played it because I just don't like it. And I'm gonna put it in the D. And uh, sorry for those of you who submitted it, that's how I feel. Now, that said, still a good piece of music, just not one for me. All right. This is a twofer. We're doing two here. Because we could have... We had Song for Ina. We had the Diamond Concerto. We had Harlequin. We had Pantomime. We had Party Piece. We had all of all of the Sparks. We had all of them. Right? And we could, be, we could do a Spark tier list if we wanted to. I'm putting Harlequin and Pantomime for the memes into one category. Uh, I just have the picture for Harlequin on here. But we, I, I couldn't pick between the two. So we're putting them in the same category. So Sparks, Harlequin, and Pantomime. 
talk about overplayed pieces. They're sister pieces or cousin pieces at least. Um, and every other, you you know, every other audition I get at the university, somebody's playing one of the two of them to uh, varying degrees of success. Um, I only let when I have high school students. I only let. Uh, I only ever let uh, the students play one of the two. Like, you can't play both. Um, I like Harlequin more than Pantomime, but I like both pieces a lot. Um, and I'm going to think, I think I'm going to go with, with Harlequin and Pantomime. We're putting them both in the B tier. Because I think if I went any lower... There would be pitchforks, and I don't believe it needs to be lower. It's played that much for reasons. Next piece. Uh, Yashide, Yashihide Aito's uh, Fantasy Variations. One of the first pieces I played in undergrad, um, and I have students play it a lot now. Um, I think this piece isn't played really well, or very often, excuse me. And I think one of my favorite recordings, one of my it's on my, one of my favorite albums, Mike Kakubo's, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, a dream in wonderland or something along those lines um phenomenal piece of music extremely well written for our instrument uh really good pacing uh and just a lot of fun uh i love the piece to death uh i will try to look for excuses to play it again and i think with everything i feel about it i think that is my first s tier that is that is our first s tier of the day is is the fantasy variations um love that piece more than anything and uh yeah i'd like to see it i think it gets played a good amount but i'd like to see it get played more maybe recorded again uh more recently um not to say that i think everybody should go check out mike kubo's um album all right the gordon jacob fantasia gets put i hear it for solo and ensembles all the time hear it for auditions all the time uh the piece itself how i feel about it uh i don't like it <laughs> i really don't like the piece i understand it's important and i understand why people like it um i can't stand the thing and uh we're gonna drop it in the d tier notice i haven't done enough yet i'm talking about pieces i don't particularly i can't particularly stand and i haven't dropped enough yet just you know don't I don't hate much of anything. All right. Next thing is, uh, so the next piece up is Peter Graham's Brilliante. Talk about concert enders. I mean, this thing's used all the time as a concert ender. Um, people use it all the time. Uh, you know, typical, very fast theme and variation. I think the last time I heard it was Adam Fry with the Georgia Brass Band at Surtec. Just a fun piece. Everybody likes it. It, it does really well. Um, don't think there's a lot of meat and potatoes in there though you know it goes fast euphonium go burr and it's a lot of fun you know th throwing it into the sea there all right piece that wasn't selected by you the community but i thought was really important to put on here because it has been put on a lot of competitions within the past like five or so years uh stutter step ben horn um the I also wanted to put more unaccompanied in here. So the stutter step by Ben Horn, it gets worked on a lot uh, here recently. A lot of people are liking it. Um, it's hard. It's definitely conceptually very, very difficult. Like it's not as predictable as a lot of the pieces in terms of like from note to note as a lot of the pieces on here. Um, but I think that it is kind of having its moment right now. Um, how I feel about it, both I've worked on it, but also having students work on it. I think it's a solid C right now, uh, with how I feel about it. We'll see for the, in the future, how we feel about that. All right. How many more? All right. So we've got the Barfield Concerto. We got a couple more concertos here and then we've got the symphonic variants. Okay. So we're getting to the end of our concertos. Now we have the will be euphonium concerto uh i've been playing this like crazy for the past two years i've been competing with the piece um i wanted to put it on this album but will be's people in the united states whoever owns the rights are were really difficult to get a hold of it was one of those situations where 
the people in the UK were like, no, talk to the people in America. And the people in America were like, no, you're supposed to talk to the people in the UK. So we will not be getting, we're getting a new concerto on my album. We're not getting uh, the will be concerto on my album. Uh, it's one of my favorite pieces of music for the instrument. I think it is the most ergonomic piece I've ever played. It just sits on the instrument really, really well. I'm throwing this in the yes. <laughs> like it's, it's my favorite concerto um, for the euphonium. My favorite piece to play. Next one is the Barfield Concerto. Um, this one kind of kind of did a few years ago what the day is doing now. It, it, it came in and a lot of people were playing it. A lot of people were talking about it. I think the thematic material of the, of the Egyptian pyramids is like really, really neat. Um, it is really high. It sits in tenor cleft the entire time, uh, but it's a gorgeous piece of music. Um, good luck to anybody other than Debondre, whoever wants to record it. Uh, I'm going, if there's another recording in there, I just might not have heard of it, but, uh, I'm going to put this one in a solid B, uh, mostly because I think it is one of those pieces that, uh, it's one of those pieces that if you're not Demandre, it's going to take you like three years to work it out. Like it's just a tough, tough piece. Now you want to talk about, all right. So on this list here, the ITEA list of standard rep, uh, you want to talk about a composer who takes up like one whole page here um it's jim kernow james kernow has a lot and both rhapsody for euphonium and oops sorry both rhapsody for euphonium and symphonic variants were put it were submitted multiple times i decided on symphonic variants um just because it's a little bit more serious of a work um rhapsody for euphonium I would probably slap in a B tier. Um, I think it's amazing. Uh, or it's a great piece of music. It's a great concert piece. It's a really good piece if you're working with an ensemble who's not, you know, super, super good. Um, as long as they have a solid oboe player. Um, but Symphonic Variants, uh, I think in terms of like their rating scale here, if I remember correctly, when this first came out, uh, it got a lot of talk because Symphonic Variants got the highest score in terms of difficulty uh, that a piece could possibly get. Um, that said, I'm sure people would argue that like the Kevin Day is harder or like, the, you know, is just because a piece is really necessarily hard. Is it like the best one? Um, it's one of the pieces I grew up listening to. Like, it's one of the first things that I was able to find on like, or some recording of it. I don't even know who the euphonium artist was on like LimeWire or something like that. Um, the piece is amazing. Uh, it works really, really well. It's stupid hard, but if you can play it, it's great. Uh, that's another one. If you're not one of the top 5% players in the world, like it's going to take you a while to get used to get going. But for me, love the piece, throwing it in a, all right, we're down to our last piece, the Jan Bach concert variations. I have some strong opinions about this piece. So I, it, when I was at UF, I was getting my doctorate. One of the first pieces that Dr. V tried to get me to play was the Jan Bach concert variations. And uh, I kept putting the piece off. I kept trying to not play it uh, for about a, sem a whole semester. Like I just like, she would be like, yeah, work on this a little bit. And then I would find some like, Oh, hey, I'm doing this thing. Can we play this this lesson? You know, I would like work my way out of it uh, because good Lord, do I hate the piece. And then we need to have a conversation. Why? 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 Why is it this big? Why can't I put it in a file link? Like, why? Why? <laughs> why? Why is tuba? To be Evonium Press pressing, like printing that so big. No one submitted this piece. I put it on here because uh, we don't have an F yet. And uh, that piece is going into the F tier. <laughs> that's our F. But yeah, so those, that's my thoughts on mostly uh, community submitted pieces here. Genuinely, again, I don't, di I'm, I'm bragging on the concert variations. When people play it really well, it's actually a really cool piece of music. I'm just not, not for me. So what do you think? Do you think I'm, I'm, all, I'm completely off base here or... Uh, do you think, you know, I make some good points? I mean, this is, I didn't go off of this on like, because of this criteria or anything, it's 1000% subjective. And if, uh, you love the concert variations and hate 
the Ito fantasy variations, you know? Different people have different opinions and we're just having fun here. If you like this video, uh, please hit the like. And if you haven't done so already, consider hitting subscribe to get more videos like this directly to you. Otherwise, y'all, I'm Aaron, helping musicians get better, faster, be happy, never satisfied, and I'll see you in the next one.